be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and all who dwell in it. Let us worship God.
greatest and first commandment, and a second is like it. She shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Joshua said to the people, 
This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Long ago, your ancestors, including Terah and the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River, and they worshipped other gods. But I took your ancestor Abram, Abraham from the land beyond the Euphrates and led him into the land of Canaan. So feared the Lord and served him wholeheartedly. Put away forever the idols of your ancestors worship when they lived beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt. Serve the Lord alone. But if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. Would you prefer the gods of your ancestors serve, serve beyond the Euphrates, or will it be the God of the Amorites in whose land you now live? But as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. The people replied, We would never abandon the Lord and serve other gods. For the, for the Lord our God is the one who rescued us and our ancestors from slavery in the land of Egypt. He performed mighty miracles before our very eyes as we traveled through the wilderness among our enemies. He preserved us. It was the Lord who drove out the Amorites and other nations living here in the land. So we too will serve the Lord, for he alone is our God. Then Joshua warned the people, You are not able to serve the Lord, for he is a holy and jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you abandon the Lord and serve other gods, he will turn against you and destroy you, even though he has been so good to you. But the people answered Joshua, No, we will serve the Lord. You are a witness to your own decision, Joshua said. You have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, they replied. We are witnesses to what we have said. All right, then, Joshua said. Destroy the idols among you and turn your hearts to the Lord, for the God, to the God of Israel. The people said to Joshua, We will serve the Lord our God. We will obey him alone. So Joshua took, so Joshua made a covenant with the people that day in Shechem, committing them to follow the decrees and regulations of the Lord. Joshua recorded these things in the book of God's instruction as a reminder of their agreement. He took a huge stone and rolled it beneath the temperate tree beside the tabernacle of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Continue with the reading of the Psalter, which is Psalm 34, 1 through 10, and actually it's Psalm 78. I don't know if we're going to change the top there. Each generation will tell the next of the glorious deeds of the Lord. <clears throat> oh, my people, listen to my instructions, open your ears to what I am saying, for I will speak to you in a parable, I will teach you hidden lessons from our past. Stories of the heard and known, stories of our ancestors and known. We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord. About his power and mighty glories. For he issued his laws to Jacob. He gave his instructions to Israel. He commanded our ancestors. He teach them to their children. So the next generation might know them. If even the children are not yet born, and they in turn will teach their own children. So each generation should set its hope anew on God. Not for the name and glory of his parables, Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, and now, and the beginning of the Amen. Our second reading is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning at verse 13. The dead in Christ will rise first, and the living will meet the Lord. And now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died so that you will not dream like people who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. 
We will tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living, when the Lord returns, will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves, then together with them, we who are alive, are still alive, and remain on the earth, will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel? <laughs> Three really powerful. I've got three really great parables in them. 
Of course, parables are stories. We should know that as well. They're not intended to be taken literally. They're intended to be used, used metaphors figuratively. And this is what most Bible commentators will tell you, don't push them too far. The details aren't going to always match up. You know, you start asking questions that get really into the details. You're missing the point of the story. You're getting lost in the details and forgetting what's the thrust of the story. So the parable is told to make a point, and we sometimes you can go too far with the other things that are ancillary and don't really fit. So that's just a caveat, just a warning. Okay. So what we have here is Matthew 25 in the midst of the last week of Jesus' life. So Matthew 21 we start, and of course we'll end in Matthew 28 with the resurrection and his appearance in the Great Commission. Go therefore into all the nations, baptizing uh, in the name of the Father, teaching them to obey everything I command, and baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So that's the very end. Lo, I be with you always to the end of the age. Okay? So that's the end of that week that we have. But he starts by a triumphal entry into Jerusalem. So he goes into Jerusalem, and they welcome him. Hail the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the Son of David. And they throw down the stuff and, and welcome him into Jerusalem. As the coming Messiah. That was Messiah language that they were using. God's anointed would come and rescue them from the kingdom of this world. We'll rescue them from the Romans. We'll rescue them from the other kingdoms and principalities and powers of this world. The king is coming. We're welcoming in. Finally, God is going to break through and restore the kingdom of the great David to now great David's greater son. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the son of David. That's, that language is very, it's not just, oh, well, we'll use it this time and something else. It's very specific. Even the son of David. That's Messiah language. So now then, Jesus goes into the temple. So that was that day. The next day, he goes into the temple. Got money. And he, he clears the temple. I said, what's he doing? What's, what's his action there? What he's saying is the temple is not acting like it should. It's been polluted. It's not doing the right thing. It's supposed to be the place where heaven and earth meet. It is to be the dwelling place of God. It is to be the place where God's truth goes forth and into the world. It's to be a light, and it's corrupt and polluted. It's not any good. And Jesus says, you know what? Destroy this temple. I will destroy this temple in three days and rebuild it. What? It took 46 years to build this latest remodeling job on the temple. Three days. Of course, he meant his body. So what he's saying is, I'm going to do something new. I'm going to take what we have, and I'm going to supersede it. I'm going to make it something better and greater. And then he starts teaching about the kingdom in these parables. In chapter 23, he talks about people that aren't doing it. And so there's a lot of consternation because he lashes out at the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the hypocrites, calls them hypocrites and says, listen, they tell you what to do, but they're not doing it themselves. And actually, it's not so, everything they say is not wrong. They got some good insights, but they don't do it. So you don't want to watch them because they're not doing it. Then he comes to chapter 24. In chapter 24, of course, by the way, one other point, you know, when the Bible was written, they didn't have chapters and verses. That's a later edition. It's only 500 years. Before that, we didn't have any of that. Okay, but it's just helpful for notations. So chapter 24, we have the subheading, Jesus foretells the future. And he talks in very dramatic terms about how it's going to happen. Kingdom will rise up against kingdom, nation against nation. There will be earthquakes and famines and wars, rumors of wars, etc. Very dramatic. But he makes a very powerful point, one that cannot be missed. However... And talking about all this is going to happen. However, no one knows the day or hour when these things will happen, not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. And he goes on to talk a little bit more, and he talks about how he'd be ready. He goes, even when, when a thief comes in, if the homeowner knew that the thief was coming, he would be ready to meet him. But, but of course, he comes in when it's unexpected. You also must be ready all the time, for the Son of Man will come when least expected. And now we get to the parable. 
of what they're calling ten bridesmaids or ten maidens. The Greek word for this is really virgins, uh, so we're not sure about bridesmaids. But anyway, he talks about it and he says they need to be ready with their oils to welcome the bridegroom when he comes, and they'll escort him in. We'll talk about that. Later. But the point of it all sums up with this. So you, too, must keep watch, for you do not know the day or the hour of my return. Let us pray. O Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your holy sight. For truly you are indeed our strength, our rock, and our only redeemer. This we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> now, the first thing I need to tell you is that we don't have a clue about the idea of what's going on here in terms of cultural practice in the ancient world, because we don't know anything about their weddings. Now, don't be surprised about that. I've been doing weddings for 40 years. 40 years. I've done hundreds of weddings. Hundreds of weddings. I have no clue what's going on today. So when they have a wedding, I mean, I know what to do when they get here, but all the stuff that surrounds them, I don't have any clue. They have bachelorette parties in Mexico. Okay, I don't, I, what's going on here? I don't understand all this stuff. I've never been to a bachelor party. No one ever invited me. I don't know what that's about, but I was never invited to a bachelor party. I, I'm actually very happy about that, by the way. I've never been in a wedding. Uh, I've never been a, a, a groomsman, never been a best man, because I was in ministry early enough that if anybody got married and wanted me in their wedding, they wanted me to do it. So, for example, my family, I did my brother's wedding and my sister's wedding and nieces and all kinds of things. So, I mean, that was more typically the way I would do it. I don't know about the wedding, but everything else that surrounds it, it's changed over these 40 years, and I'm clueless, and actually I'm very happy about that. Now, uh, so, so we have these practices, and we think that they're all well-known, but they're all, they're not written down anywhere. I said, because they, they say, yeah, I've heard people say, oh, we have to do this, and I'm thinking, well, you don't really have to do that. I don't think it's written down anywhere that you have to do that. But that's what you have to do, right? And so all these different kinds of things. Well, that's what's the same in the first century. You know, they probably did all kinds of things. We don't know what they're doing. One thing we know is they didn't have a lot of things to celebrate. Okay? The celebrations were not big in their life experience. It was like we, uh, there's a wonderful Seinfeld episode where one of the characters, if you don't know, Elaine, is works at this place, and they have a birth a cake for almost every occasion. You know, it's uh, somebody got sick, and it's, they're come back to work. They have a cake. They have a birthday. They have a never, or whatever it is. And finally, she goes, "I can't take anymore. I can't have any more cake. Can't do this anymore." That's kind of like we are, and that's a good kind of metaphor for the way we are um, in the ancient world. They don't do it very often, but when they do it, it's going to be big. Because then, they, you know, maybe they've saved, had the cap that's been fattened for a year. Now they're going to kill it and slaughter it, and they're going to have a big festival. And, you know, you don't have leftovers. You're going to, you're going to indulge. It's going to be a feast. It's going to be something. And people are going to, if they're going to travel, that's a big deal. To think about driving a couple hours away, but walking. So you get some family over there. It's two hours away by car, but now you're walking. It's a big, it's a big deal. So now they're going to have a wedding feast. So the other thing you do is you can try to make it special. And so in my mind, what's happening here is that the bridegroom is going to come from one place and go to another. And he's going to go into the wedding feast. And when he's going into the wedding feast, they've got to welcome him. And there's going to be a procession. So I don't think bridesmaids are right here. I think it's really maidens. There are going to be these people who are designated to say, we want to make sure, escort this person because you don't want the bridegroom showing up and going, knock, knock, you're going to let me in, I'm coming here. It's going to be a big fanfare because this is a procession for a big event. And so the, the maidens are there to escort him with the, with the torches. Now, <clears throat> depending on the translation you use, but I think this is the way, as I looked at it, this made the most sense to me. So you have the, the torches, which are rags wrapped around the end, and they soak them in oil just to begin with. And then you could light it, but it wouldn't stay lit for very long. So you have to have additional oil to soak the rag so that it would stay longer so you could do the procession. And so we have, and this is the best translation I saw of it, we have five sensible maidens and five silly maidens. The sensible maiden said, OK, 
okay, well, we're going to need to have this oil, so we'll have it with us, so we'll be ready, we'll be prepared, so that when the bridegroom comes, we can do it. And the silly ones are like, oh, whatever, whatever, you know, and so they, 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 they just don't have the oil. It's not like a big moral lapse. I mean, it's important to see that. It's just, they're not paying attention. They're not thinking. They're not saying, what's important? What do I have to do? And so then the call comes, the bridegroom's coming, they've got to welcome him, and then they go, oh, well, give us some of your oil. And they're like, I can't. If I give you the oil, I wouldn't have it, and I need it. And if we all shared it, the end result would be a, a really lame procession. It just wouldn't work right. So that's just not going to happen. You have to go out and get some more yourself. And so while they're out getting the more oil, the five that were sensible are able to lead the processional in. Yeah. That, that makes sense. By the way, it ties up very much like what's happening in 1 Thessalonians. So the Lord is going to return. Those who are dead in Christ will rise first, then those who are still alive will meet him in the air, and then they're going to process with him into the earth, into the kingdom. Because you don't let Jesus show up at the back door and go, okay, here you go. The, the faithful will say, he's here. We're welcoming our king. That's what they would do in the ancient world. If the king was going to attend to a city, there was a thing called, uh, the king was making an appearance. It was an adventus, which is from where we get the word uh, advent, appearing. And so he's going to, his coming is it's being announced. He's going to come. And so you go out to meet him. Because you don't want the king coming into your town with you sitting on your hand. You want to make sure you're out there clapping and welcoming the king. Because that's what you're supposed to do. So anyway, that's, so that's what's behind. So I see this all part of that. Okay, so now they come and now they're ready. And then the ones who are the silly ones have finally got it together. They come to the door and they knock and they want to get in. And <laughs> the Lord says, you know what? The, the bridegroom says, I don't really even know who you are. You, you missed it. It's over. The procession has taken place. You weren't ready. You weren't prepared. And it just, it just went by you. As if you weren't there. Oh, okay. Well, it's a big, of course, that's the point of it. So he says, be ready. Well, it begs the question, what do we do to be ready? To be prepared? Always be ready. What am I to be doing? Well, I think this is where Joshua comes in. In this wonderful passage in Joshua 24, which really is at the heart of biblical faith, really gets to what's it all about. So Joshua gathers the tribes in Shechem. Now what's happened, just to let you know, so they've been delivered out of Egypt by their God, the God of their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And actually, if you would have looked at it, you would have discovered that they didn't know that much about the God of their father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They have, there wasn't a great plan. But now God has given them his Torah, his instructions, and informed them. As he's delivered them out of Egypt, led them out of their slavery in Egypt, delivered them to the promised man, and instructed them along the way, saying, this is what it means to be the God of Israel. This is, or the people of Israel. This is what it means to be followers of the God of Israel. I've given you my name, my name Yahweh. I've delivered you. Now live like that. So now Joshua gathers them all at Shechem. This is the town. And he says, look, we've got we to make a decision here. We've got to make a choice. You can either follow the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or you can follow the gods of the people in the land where you are now living. That's your choice. Or the gods of the, you know, of the ones beyond the river, the Mesopotamia. But as for me and my household, we will serve Yahweh. So that's the call. And the whole Bible is really about, are you going to serve the one true God, or are you going to serve something else? And it's applicable in every single generation. So even though we may not follow the gods of the people in the land where we're living in the sense of, you know, um, those pagan gods and the deities that the Israelites confronted, we still have to face that all the time with whether it be uh, worldviews or or cultural practices or things that are antithetical to the faith in the one true God. That's our call. And the way we get ready, in light of what Jesus is saying here, is by being obedient and following 
that God, serving that God above all else. So that when he returns, he finds us faithful. It's an interesting thing. So sometimes it's been presented, and Jesus lays it out against the Pharisees and the Sadducees and so forth. But it's been presented sometimes that these people are trying to earn their way to heaven, doing what we call works righteousness. That's really a 15th, 16th century thing, and the Protestant Reformation, it doesn't exactly apply in this case. What they're doing is say, they looked and they said, well, God has given us these instructions, so we're to follow them. And we want to follow them so well, so punctiliously, that when God comes, when the Messiah comes, he will find that we have been faithful all this time. We have been doing what we're supposed to be doing, not violating the commandments in any way. Now, <clears throat> of course, we believe Jesus has come, the Messiah has come here, and there's a lot of other things going on. And I think another criticism we would have is that they have uh, not seen the forest for the trees. That's Jesus' criticism about some of the things that are going on. And that's a different matter. But understand what their motivation is. Essentially, that's what our motivation is here. We want to follow God and be ready by doing what it is that God wants us to do. Loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Loving your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and prophets and Jesus saying, go and do that. When you go and do that, you're being ready. You're being prepared for when the bridegroom comes. Now, I hesitate to give you this one, but I will anyway. <clears throat> so, we have Matthew 25. There's three parables in Matthew 25. There's the, this one we're looking at. The next one is about uh, faithful management. So, when, when the master returns, they'll find that they have been faithful with the things they've been entrusted to. We'll talk about that next week. But the third week is Matthew, the end of Matthew 25. Now, wonderful, wonderful passage where it says, and these, Jesus has separated the sheep and the goats. The, the heading on it is the final judgment. And he says to the sheep, Come and hear the kingdom be prepared for you before the foundation of the world. Why? Because I was naked and you clothed me. I was hungry and you fed me. I was sick and in prison and you visited me. Wait a minute. I don't recall ever doing that. That's what the, the sheep say, the faithful ones. They say, we don't remember doing that. And Jesus says, when you did it to one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did it unto me. That's being ready. They're doing it. They're just doing it. They don't they say, okay, well, he's coming. Oh, okay, the announcement's been made. He's coming. So now, let's go out and do something real quick too, so we can tidy it up and we'll be all set. It's too late. It's too late. And he says to the goats, I don't know why sheep, why don't goats? You know, it's one of those things. But he says to the goats, depart from me. I never knew you. Right? Remember this one? He says, Knock on the door. I'm sorry, I don't know you. I never knew you. For I was hungry, I was naked, and, and you didn't clothe me. I was hungry, and you didn't feed me. I was sick, and in prison, you didn't visit me. Wait a minute. You, you didn't ever see that. And he will say, when you didn't do it to the least of these brothers of mine, you didn't do it unto me. Oh, you silly, silly ones. That's really what it is. You thought at the end you could quickly make a difference, and you can't. You make a difference every day, every moment, while you're doing and being obedient, while you're serving Christ, doing that. That's how you are prepared. So that when this one comes, look, the bridegroom's coming. The announcement, the procession is there. And he finds you, he says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Inherit the kingdom that was prepared for you before the foundation of the world. We're ready. Yes, we're ready for Christ. So it not only becomes something threatening, but something wonderful, because we're welcoming our King and making and honoring Him and glorifying Him by what we do and what we say. So always be ready. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, that you have called us into your family. Thank you, Lord, that you have incorporated us into the community of your Son. We call it the Church of Jesus Christ. Thank you that we can serve you and love you, but help us to do it and always be prepared so that, using the metaphor, the oil in our lamps will not burn up, but will burn, will burn brightly and shine forth gloriously 
of your radius and your glory, your kingdom. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creek. I want to say one thing. Then we're going to sing this wonderful hymn, this Wesley hymn, from Sinners to the Gospel Feet. So just remain standing, and, and that's on the next page. Let's uh, continue. Let us confess the faith of the one holy Catholic and universal and apostolic church. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. stand at the door and knock. If those who hear my voice open the door, I will come into them and eat with them and they with me. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are all who find refuge in God. Our Savior invites those who trust him to share the feast which he has prepared. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks to Eternal God, holy and mighty, it is truly right and our greatest joy to serve you and to give you thanks and praise and to worship you in every place where your glory abides. You laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They shall perish, but you shall endure. You are always the same, and your years will never end. You made us in your image and called us to be your people, but we turn from you, leaving sin and death to reign. 
Still you loved us and sought us, and in Christ you were graced, defeated death, and opened the way to eternal life. Therefore, we praise you. Joining our voices with choirs of angels, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all the faithful of every time and place, who forever sing to the glory of your most holy name, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, whom you sent to be our Savior. He took our flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. His words are true. His touch brings healing. To all who follow him, he gives abundant life. When evil sought to destroy him, and he lay in the darkness of death, you raised him from the grave. He is our risen Lord forever. We give you thanks to the Lord Jesus, and the night before he died, took bread. After giving thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. Again, he gave thanks, gave it to his disciples, and said, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, in my blood uh, shed for you and for many for their forgiveness of sins. Um, each time we celebrate this, uh, we remember the coming of our Lord Jesus and his great sacrifice. We do this in remembrance of him. Remembering all your mighty and merciful acts, we take this bread and this wine from the gifts you have given us and celebrate with joy the redemption won for us in Jesus Christ. Accept this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving as a living and holy offering of ourselves that our lives may proclaim the one crucified and risen. Let us therefore proclaim the great mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ, Christ will come again. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, upon these two gifts that you have given us, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be for us a communion in the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, let me ask, are there any prayer requests that need to be made at this time? Any prayer requests? Yes. Pray for Linda. Pray for Linda. Yes. Um, we got an email from our, grand from our daughter-in-law her uh, daughter, Betsy, who's our granddaughter, is a nurse at the Hound Hospital. And they are getting so many COVID patients that she has for prayer for Betsy and the other workers there. They have to work overtime and okay. they are affected. Okay. Pray for uh, Betsy and then the other health care workers, but health care workers everywhere. Anywhere else? Anybody else? Okay. Let's join together in the intercessions. Our shepherd satisfies our needs in faith. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, our God, we pray for the church. Open our lips to speak of your mighty acts and make us messengers of good news, teaching your truth to coming generations. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, our God, we pray for the earth. Make us better stewards of the gifts you give conserving those resources and using them wisely while we wait the glory of your new creation. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord, our God, we pray for all nations, including our own. Let all of us put away our false idols, wealth and status and weapons of war. Let us choose instead the wisdom of your way. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Well, Lord, our God, we pray for this community. Send us quickly to help those who are in need, defend those who are dishonored or despised, and to protect those whose lives are in danger. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Oh, Lord our God, we pray for our loved ones, especially those that we have just named. We pray for Linda, we pray for Betsy, and for all the others who are working and standing on the front lines to help us with our lives. We pray for all those who are listed on our prayer list, for any who are sick or infirmed. Uh, give hope to those who worry or grieve, a hope that is firmly established in Christ and in the power of his resurrection. Lord, in your mercy. Yes. Loving shepherd, lead and guide us in green pastures and by side still waters, in right paths and through dark valleys until we feast with you in glory and dwell in your house forever with Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Number us among your saints, O God, and join us with the faithful of every age, that strengthened by their witness and supported by their fellowship, we may run with perseverance the race that is set before us, 
and may with them receive the unfading crown of glory when we stand before your throne of grace. Give us strength to serve you faithfully until the promised day of resurrection, when with the redeemed of all the ages we will feast with you at your table in glory. Amen. And as our Savior Christ has taught us to pray, so we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. So therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for it is one, of one, one loaf that we partake. When we break the bread, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? When we give thanks over the cup, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? Loving God, we thank you that you have fed us in this sacrament, united us with Christ, and given us a foretaste of the heavenly banquet in your eternal kingdom. Send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. For the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Now we stand for the benediction. Amen. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd, the sheep, by the blood of his eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom belong glory and honor forever and ever. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always, both now and forevermore. Amen.